Live from the American Riviera in Santa Barbara, California, please welcome the host of Ken Boxer Live, Mr. Ken Boxer. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for being here. What a delight. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Ken Boxer Live. I'm your host, Ken Boxer. Tonight is the night I get to interview my longtime friend, the playwright, the director, and the artist, Rod Latham. What an inspiration Rod has been to the entire artistic Santa Barbara community. His record of success is endless. And to think how long he's been in the business and to create such incredible material at such a high level is just a remarkable feat. So let's welcome Rod Latham to Ken Boxer Live. So Good nice to, to have you here. Yes, yes. It's great. Thank you. Uh, hey, wait, this is the elephant in the room, if I don't mention it. Yes. You're behind some, some I'm, glasses. I'm trying there. to be really hip and cool. <laughs> No, you I actually, always are. You don't need glasses. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to say the reason I'm wearing sunglasses is I have a, a pretty horrendous eye inf infection right now, and I'm so light sensitive that I, I would have to sit here with my eyes closed, and I don't want to do that. So that's why I'm wearing these. It's not because I'm trying to be, you know, hip and cool. Well, that's okay. I get but to see myself, your, and I your... can prep myself <laughs> in the reflection. This is cool. Hey, Spider Man, you know. <laughs> that's right. Well, first, I want to ask you. When, when did you first have the bug, that theater bug? I mean, when did it all happen? When did you just go, oh my God, that's what I want? It happened the first time I saw a live play. I was in, uh, I think I was in fourth grade. Uh, my sister, Kim, was going to Santa Barbara Junior High. I was at Cleveland School. And uh, at the time, Marjorie Luke was the director there. And they did big shows. They did big musicals. And I went to see, uh, with my family, The Music Man. Uh, Scott Weintraub was the music man, and uh, I was blown away. I was, I'm sure I was sitting there with my jaw on the floor just thinking, I got to do this. And that's, I mean, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the music man. And uh, I couldn't wait to get to junior high and work with Marjorie Luke and uh, Nancy Keel or Nancy Crane at the time. And, um, and that's, that's when I got bit by the bug. But did you do theater prior to that? I mean, no. You didn't play a tree? <laughs> oh well, you know what I did is I did I did magic and puppets. Uh -huh. When I was a kid, I would I you know make cardboard stages and do puppet shows and uh, and I was a weekend magician. You know, my grandfather would take me out to the Magic Man in Galita, and I get about once a month, and I get a new trick mm -hmm. each time and get it perfected. And yeah, I loved I loved performing. Anyone in your family a performer? Did, did your no, parents or no, anyone? they all kind of went. Oh Lord. Who, what have we got to deal with here? <laughs> you know, because we went to high school together, yes. you and I. Santa Barbara and, High. Santa Barbara High. Well, in high school, were you acting in high school? No, actually, I did all my, the, big, the, the first three years in junior high, because it was a seventh through ninth grade, um, I did shows each year at the junior high. And when I got to the high school, um, I really focused on singing. Uh, I worked with Phyllis Zimmerman. And uh, we, you know, we toured around the country and uh, made records, and I really got my singing chops in, in order. And then I went to college at the University of Kansas and got back into theater. And, you know, when you look back on all these years, you're prolific in what you do. I mean, so much. I mean, I went to your website, go to rodlatham.com, and if I were to read everything that you've done over the years, it'd be too long for this show. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just amazing stuff. And so I want to know, though, when you were, let's get back, though, to the high school. You were, you know, just involved with singing. Why didn't you take that career? Why did you end up doing something else? Um, you know, when I was in high school, I decided I wanted to be a music therapist. And that's why I went to the University of Kansas, uh, because they, they started the program in music therapy. And Jack Sears um, was the, uh, the kind of the father of of music therapy and I wanted to study under him. Um, but then I got to KU and I, I had a great time in Kansas, but I realized that it, it wasn't in the cards for me to be a music therapist, I needed to do more. It's very isolated work. And uh, I came home after two years at KU and started Access Theater. Okay, let's talk about Access <laughs> Theater because that's where you, you put yourself on the map. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. let's talk about that. I, I, it was for how many years you were doing that? 18 years we did Access Theater. And in wow, the beginning, uh, <laughs> and, and we, you know, we started as a community theater, all volunteer. And over the years, we, we just kept raising the bar. 
and created original works and we ended up becoming a professional company and hired equity actors and we toured literally all over the United States to Canada, to Europe. Uh, we, we taped one of our shows for television, Storm Reading. Uh, went to the Kennedy Center. And, and Storm Reading was critically acclaimed. I mean, it, it was, was yeah. everywhere. Yeah. We toured Imagine that show for six years um, and, and then ended up taping it at the Libero for television. Do you think it could have been uh, an off-Broadway or Broadway show? Do you think it could have been done? Um, well, we did it in New York. Uh, we did it at uh, Tribeca College uh, when we were touring up the East Coast. Um, you know, Storm Reading was, was such a unique show, and it, in my opinion, it doesn't work without Neil Marcus because it was his story. Sure. And, um, and Neil couldn't keep doing it forever and ever and ever, although I'm happy to say that today he is still doing performance art. Uh, up in Berkeley, right. and uh, he's an amazing relationship. And they, uh, he and his gal travel over the, all over the world and do like installation art and performance art. Well, why so. did Access eventually stop? Why didn't it just continue? And this is a thirty-minute show, <laughs> <laughs> but it was so successful. Um, it was, you know, and after, enjoyed by everybody. After eighteen years, I realized that um, I, w I was the you know a Type A workaholic. I, I had no life. And I realized when I was turning 40 that, and God, how long ago was that? <laughs> Let's uh, not that say. I, yeah, we We're won't, in the same we won't age say. Group. <laughs> but I, I needed a break, and um, I didn't have anybody waiting to step in to become artistic director, administrative director, mm -hmm. grant writer. And so the board met. We, we, we looked carefully at where we had come, what we had accomplished, and decided it was okay to, to say, you know, this was great. So it's one of those decisions also is like, uh, we've done as much as we could. Yeah. You know, what more can I do in directing and write, you know, in yeah. this, in this yeah. little, you know, genre. And, you know, it takes a lot of time and energy to keep a nonprofit theater company going. Um, and it, it, it certainly took its toll on me, and I, but I don't regret it for a second. You know, being able to create original theater, uh, to tour it, you know, nationally, internationally, was I wouldn't trade that for the world. Okay, but so. one thing though you had mentioned, you received an award, the Princess Grace Award. Princess Grace Award. Yeah. They don't just hand those out. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, we have this wonderful picture of you with Frank Sinatra yeah. greeting you. And what was that like? And first off, how did that come about that you would get this award? And uh, what was it like to actually be a part of that? It was mind blowing. Uh, it was it was definitely a highlight of my life. Uh, we were nominated by Barbara Sinatra. Uh, we toured in our days with Access Theater. We toured often to Palm Springs, and the Sinatras lived in Palm Springs a lot of the time. And Kirk and Michael Douglas were both supportive. In fact, Michael was on our board for almost ten years, mm -hmm. and uh, so they they brought us notoriety when we went to the desert. And uh, Barbara was on the board, um, actually was friends with people on the board of the Princess Grace Foundation. And the very first year they, they formed that foundation, uh, we were nominated as a company. And uh, so the, the first round of awards, which were in Beverly Hills over a three-day period, uh, where I got to meet you know, luminaries that sure. you know, I'll, I'll never forget. And then the royal family, you know, presented the award, and, along with Frank Sinatra. Wow! I'm so, gonna, I'm yeah. give you a hand. That's, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's amazing. It was, it was, um, yeah, it was an amazing, <laughs> amazing experience. Well, you know, you were around all these luminaries, but growing up, you were around them at the beginning. I mean, think of all the Santa Barbara talent that you were involved with. You know, and none of us knew at the time. Well, name, name some of the people. The rattle mob. People well, recognize you know, Dante De Loretto, you know, he and I both were, were the same age and went all through school together. We performed, uh, you know, under the tutelage of Marjorie Luke, you know, at Santa Barbara Junior High. Mm -hmm. Anthony Edwards and I became really good friends. And Tony was the lead donor for the Marjorie Luke Theater. It's all, you know, it's, right. a, it's a crazy web and of, Brad of Hall, connections. Brad not Hall. Not to forget Brad Hall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great, you know, great people. We all we all grew up together. We performed together, and um, and we were inspired by really high quality teaching. And um, I really, it's it, it never hurts to acknowledge inspiring teachers uh, because everybody's had a great inspiring teacher. But if you look at all the teachers you've had, there's a few that stand out. Mm -hmm. You know, and Marjorie Luke was one of those. Well, 
you know, there's a lot of our viewers have been to the <clears throat> theater, but you knew Marjorie Luke. Yes, yeah, I was, never she had was, the fortune. She was my drama teacher. Okay, uh, I never had the opportunity to meet her, and a lot of other people never had that opportunity. What was she like? Um, Marge was was strict but fun. Uh, she supported people to the moon and back. Uh, she took in people who who were who didn't fit in anywhere else. <clears throat> so if you weren't if you weren't you know, on the football team or the baseball team or the soccer team, and he wanted to find a home backstage at, in the theater was a safe place. And she encouraged people to, to really stretch and, and take risks. And as adults, if we don't do that, you know, we don't, we don't get anywhere. Right. So the training we got, you know, at a junior high school level was really extraordinary. Well, you know, uh, we've had many actors sitting right where you are, and many of them say, especially stage actors, that today's actor needs to sing, dance, and act. They have to do it all. Do you agree with that? Well, if you, if you want to be successful, you, you either have to be really, really good at one of those, or, I mean, if you want to work in theater, and certainly musical theater, you do have to do them all. Right, but if you can't sing, how do you get, <laughs> how do you get by? Don't try out for a musical. Don't try for a musical. <laughs> Okay, yeah. your career has been long, and as I mentioned, uh, and you're still a young man. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you are also an artist. I do visual art. Um, I do assemblage, and uh, assemblage, if, if folks are watching or aren't familiar, it's a, it, my style of assemblage is three-dimensional um, sculptures with, with found objects, and I use mostly vintage objects. And um, Anthony Askew is, is one of my mentors. Um, you remember Tony from, sure. from uh, Santa Barbara High sure. when we were students there. He's an amazing artist uh, and very supportive and nurturing. Um, and I, I got into assemblage because it was a great way to use a different part of my brain that I had never exercised before. And a lot of my assemblage works are like small stages where I, where I actually get to build stories. I use old vintage photos and old tools and you know metal and wood and glass and But you're paper. limited to the things around you. Or well, do I you hunt. wait, do you have the idea first and you go and go and go find no, them? No, just the opposite. Really? I hunt okay. for I hunt for objects and and uh, and pictures and anything that's you know catches my eye. And if you could see my garage, <laughs> it's a mess. Oh, really? <laughs> but it's it's all the stuff I've collected over the years. And I'll go out and I'll start and I'll pick up one object or one photo and literally let that object dictate and, and inform me on what else it wants to be joined with. And then I go around the garage and I start picking out pieces and in a day or a week or a month, I've got a piece. But I never know what it's going to look like until it's finished. Is that, the, is that identical to the way you create your plays? The same kind of philosophy that you don't know the ending? But, uh, when I'm writing a play, mm -hmm. yes, but oftentimes, um, oftentimes a story, I, I'll have the story arc in my head first. Whereas with assemblage, I don't, I don't limit myself at all. Like I'll, I'll literally let things speak to me, mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly old photos. Um, I, I try to listen to the people in those photos, and they take me on journeys. And that process of building a piece for me is, is zen. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. And I'm almost to the point where <clears throat> when I'm done with a piece, I, I, I enjoy it and I put it aside and, and I'm, I'm kind of done because it, it's the process that I love so much. Um, it's fun to show them and to, to do a show with right. the assemblage, but um, I, I love the process of But when creating. you say you're done, I'm fascinated by that. As a, as I'm not an artist, but you're an artist. When you're done, do you ever, though, go back and go, mm, wait a second, I've got to change this oh, sure. a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, know? and I've done that. I've, I've taken, but nobody else would know. No, no, no. no. I, I take pieces completely apart and reuse pieces. If it's something that either I haven't sold or uh, that just doesn't inspire me anymore, mm -hmm. I just break it all apart and start over. Really? <laughs> yeah. You don't just put that up aside and start um, something Well, else? it's not common that I do that, but no, I have but done that have with done about that. probably about four or five pieces. But which is more enjoyable for you? Is that more... Is it the, this type of art or actually, you know, directing? Oh, that's a really tough question. I love directing. I love creating original works for the stage. 
Um, it's a very interactive process. Uh, creating assemblage is very, very singular for me. It's, a, it's an inward journey. Mm -hmm. Directing is an outward journey. And I love them both because it, it helps me stay in balance. But when you started, I'd have to think there wasn't an internet and there certainly wasn't a computer. Nope. So how has that changed for oh. you as a writer? <laughs> Well, having the internet and having mm -hmm. everything available to you versus you know the typewriter on the onion paper yep. and the writing most the, of the white paper. out exactly exactly <laughs> it's you know it makes things happen much faster you know I'm, I'm writing right now on unfinished business and you know if i'm looking for a word or a phrase or a concept or a synonym i, I type in really quick thesaurus i put in the word it's like oh, there's my word boom and i'm back to writing the script Whereas before, you'd have to go pick up the thesaurus off the shelf right, and right. flip through and look, and you know, it's just it's so much faster and more economical. I would imagine that you're not only faster, but everything's at your fingertips of, yeah. like you said, finding the words. Yeah, no. I don't use paper much anymore unless I'm on a train or a plane, and then I do write. You know, I'll take a, a you know, a notebook with me and I'll write with a pen. And now, if you, I would imagine, even if you're casting <clears throat> for a part, it's right in front of you you pretty much can look at people's resumes instantly. True. Right? Yeah. Wow. That's from what you were doing before. Yeah. It's a different world now. Well, talk about, you, you briefly mentioned it, the unfinished business. Yeah. All our lives are a little bit like that, aren't they? They are. They are. And this is, a, this is my first autobiographical play, um, which is a whole different journey from writing a piece that is about other people and other stories. So when you write about your own story and your own experiences, uh, it, is, it is such a different journey. Um, this will be um, my third draft of this play. Um, I, I staged it about two years ago at Center Stage in a very reduced version just to kind of get a sense of, is there something here worth pursuing? I brought well, it back. Stop right there. When you're yeah. at that point, is that like a comedian <clears throat> who will try his who's going to be on The Tonight Show, they'll try their stuff out sure. at a comedy shop just to see what's going to react? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so we're, you're at that point. What kind of reaction did you get? It was very strong. It was very, very strong. It was an, it was an incredibly emotional journey for me and for my family uh, because it basically centers around the day my mom died. And people think, oh my God, this is going to be depressing. Right, this right. is like, ooh, sure. heavy duty. The play actually has a lot of humor in it, and, and in this draft I'm working on now, it has even more humor. Um, not, not guffaw humor, but human, you know, experiential humor. And, um, and it, it, um, well, it's just one of those plays you have to see. <laughs> it's, I put the whole audience on stage with the actors, so we don't, when we're at the libero, I put 145 people in a U-shaped seating configuration on stage with the actors in the middle. Now, so what it's did very that, did intimate. That, but that's also going to create some problems, especially somebody wants to get up and, you know, go Yeah, relieve. we don't let them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no going to the bathroom during this play. <laughs> but that would have, you know, or someone's <clears throat> having a coughing attack. I mean, do you somehow interwine, you know, that if it happens, what you do? Um, when, when it's, no, so, no one's ever asked me that before. And, and looking back on all the performances we did, it never happened. So uh, maybe in January when we're bringing it back, if it does, I'll think about you. <laughs> and I'll think, I wish he wouldn't have asked me that question because oh, no. now somebody's coughing. But, but yeah, what, it never, what, did, it never what did it create, though, for you to have that type of intimacy? Well, you know, theater... The reason I still do theater is because I think that we are losing the capacity to communicate human to human. And because of technology, because of texting, because of video and computers, I think we're losing our humanity. And so anything I can do to create a piece that brings people together uh, in an intimate setting and tell a story and affect those people that are sitting this far away from you as an actor, I think that's magic. And um, this play actually incorporates the whole audience and the audience learns as the play is unfolding that they're actually characters in the play. They don't have to say anything, oh, really? wow. but it's the way, the way the play unfolds, the audience realizes that it is the gathering that, that showed up in my mom's bedroom. Well, well, once the play begins, are you all of a sudden out? You don't stay 
and see oh, no. show no, to I show. Stay. You do. <laughs> yeah. you do. Some, that, some directors, hard, though. Um, some directors like to leave and just say, okay, my job is done. Right. Now go do the play, and I'm going to go to Maui or something. Right. right. Not me. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm there. I see every performance because I wrote the play as well. I want to hear reactions. I want to see. I want to watch the chemistry between the audience and the actor. Uh, I want to hear the lines. I want to hear if there's a better way to to tweak a mm -hmm. line or a scene. Um, so no, it's it's an it's an ongoing really? process for me. So by the end of the show, the end of the run, we could have somewhat a different type of performance oh, than yeah. from the beginning. I changed lines. You know, I'll change lines in the middle of a run. Actors don't like it, and I don't like doing it to <laughs> actors, but I will always ask first. It's like, do you mind if we tweak this a little bit? If it's, if it's going to throw you, we won't do it. And they're like, no, 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 bring it on, bring it on. Let's... And uh, yeah, so it's fun to, to, to mold the show as it's up you know, in, in performance. Well, what about, here we do our show in Santa Barbara. How, how has Santa Barbara affected you in your artistic endeavors? Do you, do you ever get a feel for that? Is this the place where you just have to create here, or and because you were in, was it? You said you were in. Kansas. I was in Kansas, Kansas for two years. Yeah. Well, what's what's amazing for me about Santa Barbara, as I said earlier, Santa Barbara has always supported uh, artists and and artistic work um, in a in a wonderful way. I feel incredibly supported here. I grew up in a family that loved me, and I knew that, and that made a huge difference. And then I, I realized I live in a community where people support each other. And they, you know, there's so many nonprofits here, so many charitable causes. And it's be, part of it is because the people that live here care about each other. So as an artist living in a community like that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it couldn't get any better. Well, do you think you'll ever take on another responsibility of, of you know, like the Marjorie Luke Theater being on, you know, on their board or going on to some other, you know, production here in Santa Barbara not just a theater production but I mean a project, a project. Yeah. yeah oh you know I wouldn't I wouldn't discount that um, I've been involved in a lot of I've been on three boards of theaters in Santa Barbara and um, and I'm not on any boards right now by choice because I have spent <laughs> a lot of time I've spent about 20 years being on boards and it's a lot of work if you're a good board member you work a lot and um, I have to pay my mortgage sure and uh, so I have to keep looking for paid work as well um, but you know, working on the Marjorie Luke uh, for 12 years and overseeing the renovation of the theater, I love walking back in there now and producing there. Um, you know, Seniors Have Talent just happened there a few weeks Let's ago. Let's talk about that because we just have a few more minutes. Yeah. that I heard was I didn't go to that. We went. My wife and I went to the Fab Four and yes. loved that show, the 10 year anniversary show. Exactly. But yeah. tell us about this other well, show with the seniors. The senior show um, is going to be an annual event now. Um, it'll most likely be called something different next year, but it's a it's a um, an assemblage of seniors who are amazing artists, singers, dancers, actors, comedians, and uh, it's a it's a two hour variety show. Uh, and the Center for Successful Aging is the sponsor, and it's a benefit for them. And now, did uh, you create this, or they come to you? They came to me and said they wanted to do a talent show, and I said, well, how about a musical variety show? <laughs> Not really into doing talent shows. And they well, said, the great. Wait, what's the difference? Well, they wanted it originally to be a competition, and oh, I didn't oh, want to okay. do a competition. Okay. Um, I just wanted to celebrate the talent. Uh, and so that's what we did. We did it last year for the first time, and then this year. Uh, and, you know, we filled the house at the Luke, you know, 800 people, and uh, it, it was very warmly received. So. But why don't, we, why don't we have more of that? When you think about it, you, you always think of young people in theater. But there's this... There's a untapped huge untapped resource of talent. Uh, and a lot of times, seniors don't either see, don't see the opportunity or people don't reach out to them to involve them. And that's exactly what this show does. In fact, if you're watching and you want to be in next year's show, go to my website, rodlatham.com, and send me an email because <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for talent already for and next year. And what type year. of talent are you looking for, though? Singers, uh, musicians, dancers, comedians, actors. You have any tap dancers? I happen to like tap dancers, ah, but I'm not going to be in the um, scene. Silver Follies yeah. actually is going to, I think, do some tap dancing next year. Oh, great. Do you yeah. ever work with um, Bash? You know the Bash? I'm, they have I'm a lot very of familiar with Bash. Um, I've, I was a judge for one of their shows. Oh, one really? Year. Yeah. Derek Curtis. Derek is, a, is just Amazing. the best. Amazing yeah. dancer. Yeah. And, you know, and it all seems to interconnect in the small town. Yeah. Everybody, not like you're all fighting for 
space on the stage, everyone seems to be, you know, it's, you know, uh, quite uh, friendly. Oh yeah, and people work together, and there's a lot of overlap. It's a small town, and yeah. so. And you got to work. Work. You got to work with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we we talked earlier about um, your work with Access, and you know, I just can't. I, I saw one of those shows, and it, it, I'm, it's it's just to me. I don't, I wish you hadn't have stopped. I, I'm going <laughs> back to this because. It was such a good production. You know, your, your whole Access Theater was just an amazing production. Yeah. Well, I don't want you, I didn't want mm -hmm. you to stop. It was very difficult. It was, it was the hardest decision I've ever made in my life to, to, to leave and to close that company. Um, 18 years is a long time. I know. And, um, and but I had 18 years of enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad we did it. I'm really glad we did it. I mean, we, 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 um, we kind of invented or were a part of inventing accessible theater. And that's, uh, it's quite a legacy. And uh, I'm still in touch with so many people that I worked with over those years on a national level. And, um, and I do miss it, but I had a lot more energy when I was in my 20s and 30s. Right. And, I understand, yeah. Uh, but your yeah. legacy is gonna continue. Well, thank you. you. Know? And I know we're gonna see so much more. Oh, there's more Broadway to come. Though. You know, more to come. I know, and you're, you've got your finger on the pulse of this town, so I know when things are happening, you're going to be there. <laughs> and I'm so glad you were here, and I hope your eye gets better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's always great talking to you, Cannon. I'm glad you brought your show back. Thank because you. Because we've missed you all, that, that hiatus between the last round and this round, so it's great to have you back on the air. It's, you know, the nice thing about this show is I get to meet my, my friends I haven't seen for a long time, and I also get to be the most interesting people in the entertainment industry. Yeah. And you get to meet them all the time, too. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll see you really soon. I Great. Hope. Continue okay. success. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for another edition of Ken Boxer Live. So be sure to tune in to our next show because not only do we have the internationally known Iron Chef Kat Cora sitting right here in our studio, but I have a special, very special announcement. Joining me for our next show as my new co-host will be the very talented world figure skating champion and two-time Olympian, Ty Babylonia. I'm so very delighted to have Ty joining our production crew. So for my guest, Rod Latham, and for my director, Nick Ferretti, and for my entire production crew, I'm Ken Boxer saying, Ty Babylonia, and I will see you next time on Ken Boxer Live. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>